Call of Duty. These days, it's practically shorthand for big, uninspired, AAA first-person shooter. The video game equivalent to the Michael Bay summer blockbuster. Does Bay even do summer blockbusters anymore? Eh, anyway. It wasn't always that way, though. In the first part of this series, we looked at the game's humble roots. Originally released in 2003, Call of Duty would usher in a revolution in FPS gaming, comparable to that of Quake, if not Doom. The original series was set in World War II, the wildly popular sequel to The World War. While modern Call of Duty games feature plot lines seemingly written by 14-year-old boys inspired by Tom Clancy and Peyote, the original game simply put the player in the boots of a soldier fighting through some of the war's most famous battles, or at least the ones that became subjects for major motion pictures. The early games popularized some features such as using iron sights, but it was a little behind the curve when it came to some other features that we now see as standards in the FPS. For example, Call of Duty and United Offensive didn't have a dedicated grenade button. But with the first true Call of Duty sequel, all that would change. Call of Duty 2 came out in 2005 on PC and Xbox 360. And right away you'll notice how much better it looks. The detail and animation aren't up to the standard of the later Modern Warfare series. The game actually uses the same modified id Tech 3 engine as the first game. But they're definitely a massive improvement on the original game's graphics. The biggest change you're going to notice is regenerating health, and I know this has been somewhat controversial in recent years. Regenerating health in one form or another was already a thing when the first Call of Duty was released. In Halo, you had your recharging shield, and Red Faction 2 had a regenerating health bar. But in both of those games, there were ways to lose health in such a way as to require medkits. Call of Duty 2 would do away with this system entirely. Once you take a certain amount of damage, your screen basically tells you, and you have to get to cover for a few seconds until you're good to go again. Everyone's familiar with this now. In terms of game mechanics, I can totally understand why they did this. Just like in the first game, the slightest exposed pixel of your character model can be targeted and hit, even when you're sure you're behind cover. In the first game, this could become a problem in prolonged firefights because there might not be any health pickups lying around. This can lead to a lot of dying and reloading. So regenerating health greatly reduces player deaths and reloading, prolonging continuous gameplay and making things far less frustrating. The problem with regenerating health, however, is that it often makes the game feel way too easy. It's not unusual to take a burst of fire from an MG42 right in the chest and only have to duck into cover for a few seconds until you're ready to go again. Obviously, taking grievous wounds and fixing them instantly by picking up health packs is just as unrealistic as ducking back into cover to catch your breath after being shot in the face with a Mauser carbine, but at least health pickups are finite. This disciplines the player from taking unnecessary risks, whereas Call of Duty 2's regenerating health system is fairly lenient, meaning many times you can get away with running around in the open or charging into rooms blindly without dying. And while the health system usually means getting through the game faster, there are times when the necessity of having to frequently duck behind cover and wait a few seconds gets a bit annoying to the point where you wonder if dying and reloading might actually be preferable. But there is one major counterbalance to this, which is grenades. A grenade indicator warns you anytime you're dangerously close to a grenade that's about to detonate. And if you're caught in the blast radius, it's an insta-kill. Now this feature works pretty well, but the downside is that it seems like the enemy is constantly spamming grenades, meaning you're having to continually dodge them. Worse still, you couldn't throw them back in this game. Normally the grenade indicator works pretty well, except on those occasions where you move into the kill radius on a grenade that's about to detonate. But like I said, it often seems like you're just constantly dodging grenades grenades and waiting for them to go off. One nice new feature is that you no longer have to play through each character's entire campaign to advance to the next one. Just playing through a few missions of one campaign will unlock the next one and so on. Once you beat the game, you can choose any level you want at your own leisure. On the other hand, you no longer have a manual save, but the checkpoints seem more frequent in this game. One thing you'll notice right away about the combat is that now your allies call out the position of enemies, and if you happen to know any German, you'll notice the enemies pointing out your location as well. Also, my German's not great, but I swear they will occasionally insult your sister. Sometimes all the screaming gets annoying, but not only is it more realistic to have soldiers communicating while fighting, but the constant German screaming alerts you to their presence, and so you're less likely to have one sneak up behind you and kill you. One funny thing here is that when I first had this game, I had the Russian language localization, meaning that all the allied voices were in Russian. So recently I played the English version and I got to hear that audio for the first time. Now listen to the Russian accent when an NPC says the word sandbags. Sandbags. 
Sounds like they got the guy from Life of Boris to do the voiceover. Once again, you have a Soviet, British, and American campaign, though now in that order. And the Soviet campaign opens with a new tutorial, where you'll be happy to know that there's now a dedicated grenade button, which the first game, of course, lacked. Although in this tutorial, you're gonna use potatoes instead of grenades. Yes, that's right, I said potatoes. <laughs> Hey, you missed, pal. But at least that affords you some interesting opportunities. Throw one in that doorway, Vasily. Not bad, not bad. The tutorial takes place during the defense of Moscow in 1941, and in the middle of it, you're interrupted by a German attack, which helps you get used to the new combat mechanics. One of those, by the way, is smoke grenades, which will really come in handy in some parts of the game. After the tutorial, the Soviet campaign puts you back in Stalingrad. Soon you'll get a sniper rifle, and it wobbles much more now, and you have to use the shift key while aiming to hold your breath in order to steady the rifle. At times, you'll have to fight tanks in the city, and what I don't like is that they have you using these sticky bombs like the ones in Saving Private Ryan. You don't get proper anti-tank weapons until much later in the game. I don't know why they didn't just give you Molotov cocktails, or as the Soviets officially called them at the time, bottles with incendiary mixture. Because in Stalingrad, these were used quite often against tanks. In this game, you'll often find you have little choice but to put yourself in extreme danger just to destroy some of these tanks. But I did notice you can make the task easier with the careful use of smoke grenades. The Soviet campaign also introduces a new mission type, where you have a more open area with multiple objectives over the map. You're given the option of clearing those objectives out in whatever order you choose. All in all, the Stalingrad campaign is pretty well modeled. My only problem with it is that it seems really short, and this is kind of a nitpick, but it starts early in December 1942, a few weeks after the German 6th Army had become encircled by the Red Army. Obviously, at this point, the Germans within the city were far from beaten physically or in terms of morale, but they weren't fighting from a position of power the way they were in the mid-September days of the first Call of Duty campaign. I feel like it would have been much more interesting to see the fighting in, like, the Barakati factory that happened in October. Or maybe an uphill fight to take or retake Mamayev Kurgan. Or maybe they could have given us the missions outside the city of Stalingrad. The first console release of Call of Duty featured a tank mission where you took part in the raid at Tatsinskaya Airfield, for example. In general, the Soviet campaign feels really short and there's no real climax or big set piece. But at least you've got that brap gun. Next, you go to the British campaign in the North African desert, just before the start of the El Alamein offensive. There, you'll blow up ammo depots, defend a town from mechanized attack with the help of artillery support, and you'll get to use a British Crusader tank assaulting German defensive positions. Eventually, you'll liberate the port of Tunis. After that, you unlock the American campaign, or you can stick with the Brits and their Normandy campaign to take the town of Caen. The British campaign is interesting because it's the only one that actually takes place across two theaters, but like the Soviet campaign, it doesn't really have much in the way of a big set-piece battle. The American campaign takes place on, you guessed it, D-Day. But in this case, you're one of the rangers scaling the cliffs at Pont du Hoc. Pont, Pont du Hoc, Pont du Hoc, rather than hitting the beaches. Of course, that doesn't mean we still can't rip off Saving Private Ryan. If you're not familiar with the event behind this, Pont du Hall, Pont de, that place, is basically a high cliff that jutted out into the English Channel. And from the top of it, the Germans had defensive works believed to contain large caliber guns, which could cover both Utah and Omaha Beach. The Rangers had to scale the cliffs using special grappling hooks and rope ladders, and once there, they moved inland and destroyed some 15.5 centimeter howitzers before facing German counterattacks and finally being reinforced and relieved roughly two days later. In general, most of this battle is portrayed fairly faithfully, at least by action video game standards. After that, however, the campaign weakens. You'll have several missions getting into Germany through the Siegfried Line. And many of these missions just consist of taking European villages that look more or less the same. Plus, at this point, you've already experienced something similar in the British Khan missions. And once again, the final battle is a bit of a letdown. You basically have to destroy two Tiger tanks. That's it. By now, you've already taken out tanks this way several times in the Soviet campaign, and I'd even venture to say it was easier in this final battle. 
One thing I do love about this American campaign, however, is this one mission where you have to hold out against a German counterattack in this town. And when you have about a minute left before your reinforcements show up, you start hearing this swelling, schmaltzy Spielberg movie soundtrack. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just had this idea of how funny it would be if the soldiers in game actually heard this music playing. As if in World War II, soldiers could actually tell their reinforcements were there to save them because there was this schmaltzy movie soundtrack that they could suddenly hear in the distance. Like just as the Germans are about to overrun the American positions, some private's like, Hey Sarge, we're saved! I can hear some emotional music swelling! By now you're probably noticing a common theme in my criticism here, so we might as well just address it. Apart from the issues of regenerating health and nade spamming, the game's campaign is fairly short and involves a lot of combat that is very repetitive or unremarkable. Now, I realize that this does somewhat contradict one of my complaints about the campaign in the first game, that you'd start in some historical battle and then transition to some mission clearly inspired by the Dirty Dozen or Force 10 from Navarone. In a sense, Call of Duty 2's choices here are a bit more realistic because, let's face it, for most participants in World War II, it wasn't an exciting sightseeing tour, but a bloody slog through nearly identical villages, forests, steppes, or desert. But this is a work of fiction. There are options. And there were so many daring and seemingly suicidal operations carried out during the war that would have made great missions if only someone had done a little more research. For the Soviet campaign, one could look at the career of Viktor Leonov, a two-time hero of the Soviet Union title winner who fought as a naval scout, kind of like Navy SEALs without all the self-help books, in both the European and Pacific theaters. During one mission, in support of an amphibious landing in 1944, Leonov and his comrades attacked and captured a coastal battery at Cape Kristovi. And when the Germans sent reinforcements to take it back, they repelled the counterattack with the help of the Germans' own 88mm guns. Now that already sounds like a Call of Duty mission right there, doesn't it? Same with the British. Why not have a mission depicting the famous St. Nazaire raid? Or one where you could play as one of the Norwegian commandos who sabotaged the Germans' heavy water production capability by mounting a raid on the Vemork power plant. Or the Brunewald raid in 1942, where British paras dropped into France and captured German radar equipment. The Brits were doing all kinds of crazy shit during the Second World War. I guess that's what happens when you have people like the future creator of James Bond planning operations for you. As for the American side, they started off with the most exciting set piece of scaling the cliffs at D-Day, but then in the end you're just taking one more German village. Why not depict something like the 82nd Airborne's capture of Nijmegen Bridge, for example? In the devs' defense, however, this was before they started doing a lot of POV character switching, something that became more common in the Modern Warfare series. It's odd though, because in these early games, your character had no arc or identity, so switching between an ordinary Red Army soldier in Stalingrad to a Red Navy recon scout in 1944 wouldn't have been really a big deal. That being said, however, the game is a vast improvement over the original, building off what made that work so well. The graphics were a huge improvement, and I feel the levels were even more non-linear than in the first game. Now the last game I played in the early World War II series was World at War, released in 2008. This one's made by Treyarch, which had worked on earlier Call of Duty games and is most well known for the Black Ops series. I've gotta say, World at War always hits differently for me, and when I played it again, I realized that this is where the series was making a turn in the direction that would later become standard for the whole series, whether Modern Warfare or Black Ops. I'm talking about all the dialogue, scripted moments, and shitty writing. On a positive note, this is the first Call of Duty game to feature fighting in the Pacific Theater. Now, I've noticed that Treyarch Call of Duty games tend to have some issues getting basic history and geography right, and when you start the single-player campaign, you notice right away, because it says this. Yeah, the Japanese invasion of Indochina happened in 1940, my dudes. You were thinking of the invasion of mainland China after the Japanese conquest of Manchuria in 1931. Anyway, you play these missions as a Marine who gets rescued from the Japanese on the island of Makin, and then later you'll land a Peleliu, where you'll have several different missions. There's a brief interlude where you'll find yourself as a crewman on a PBY Catalina flying boat, and although it's pretty unrealistic, it's a nice change of pace. It does go on a bit long though. Finally, you'll take part in the Battle of Okinawa. These missions will be interspersed with the Soviet campaign, which begins in, you guessed it, Stalingrad.
But maybe they haven't ripped off Enemy at the Gates. Oh, they did. Of course they did. And yet, Enemy at the Gates and the first Call of Duty games did this better because, folks, this is not Stalingrad. It quickly becomes apparent that somebody seems to have mixed up Stalingrad for Leningrad, today St. Petersburg. You've got all these very Western European-looking buildings and canals, and at one point you save yourself by jumping into a river running through the city. Folks, Volgograd is situated along a river. It doesn't have one running through it like this. What's worse is you're given a sniper rifle again, but this playthrough, I don't remember finding a Papa Shaw 41 to brap brap with. Later in the game, you'll be at the Battle of Berlin and you'll get the brap brap then. But I wanted to do that in Stalingrad, or at least pseudo-Stalingrad in this case. Now, speaking of the Battle of Berlin, we need to talk about Rezno. From this moment on, every step we take brings us closer to Berlin, closer to victory, closer to revenge. So in case you first got acquainted with this awful character, Viktor Reznov in Call of Duty Black Ops, he is originally introduced in World at War. You are with this jackass pretty much the entire Soviet campaign. Viktor Reznov is a soldier in the 69th Rifle Regiment of the 420th Guard Stereotype Division, and he is voiced by, I shit you not, Gary Oldman. Gary everyone! Oldman. Now, no disrespect to Gary, he did a good job with the material he was given. But throughout the entire campaign, Reznov almost never shuts up, ever. And half the time, all he's screaming is, Kill the Germans! Vengeance will be ours, comrades! Their land! Their blood! For the motherland! By the time you get to Berlin, you want to press F to denounce this loudmouth to the NKVD, I swear. What I hate about this is that Reznov and all the Red Army soldiers in this game are caricatures. Believe it or not, Red Army infantry actually had tactics. They didn't just rush forward in waves shouting, La Rodino! This seems to be the start of the edginess that only got worse in Black Ops and the other Call of Duty games. There's a lot more blood than any previous Call of Duty game, and what really annoys me is the metal soundtrack in some parts. Yes, I make fun of the schmaltzy Spielberg movie music because it's a cliche, but I'm a firm believer that modern music, or at least metal or rock music, doesn't belong in anything about the Second World War. Very sorry, Sabaton, I, I guess. World of War has its good points, sure. The graphics and animation are far above Call of Duty 2. You now have the ability to toss grenades back if they land near you. Also, just finally getting a Call of Duty game that dealt with the Pacific Theater was a great thing. And you'll get to use some very unique weapons like a sawed-off trench shotgun. Plus, this is the first Call of Duty game where you could tactically reload the M1 Garand. Prior to this, it seems a lot of game devs believe you couldn't manually reload an M1 until all rounds were fired. WRONG! There are also collectibles to find, though I have no idea what happens if you get all of them. And finally, this is the game that brought us the famous Zombies mode, which you can unlock after finishing the single-player campaign. It's not a bad game, just more linear, more scripted, and edgier, with less concern for historical accuracy in some places. Call of Duty was never anywhere near war game accurate, but like I said, with those games I could at least lose myself in the general spirit of the setting and ignore the things they got wrong. But I can't pretend this looks anything like Stalingrad. And so that's pretty much it. After that, the series leaped into the modern era with Modern Warfare and Black Ops. I haven't played 2017's Call of Duty World War II, but I don't really have much of an interest to do so. It seems melodramatic like the Modern Warfare series, and based on what I've seen, it doesn't really look that much better than World at War. I think what made earlier Call of Duty games great was the lack of cutscenes and shorter scripted moments. Getting from objective to objective feels more based on skill rather than just pressing F at the right time. The first two games also let you jump into the action fairly quickly if you just want some mindless shooting gallery action. Rather than creating some dramatic plot, the early games used the historical battles as their backstory. And you're just an ordinary Joe, Yvonne, or Tommy in the middle of it. And that's kind of how it was for many soldiers in that war, in any war really. They didn't have character arcs, they weren't archetypes or protagonists, and they didn't save the cat. But either through their survival or sacrifice, they saved the world. Alright folks, well there it is, the second part of these reviews. As always, I ask you to click like, subscribe, share the video, leave a comment. I'm always interested in hearing people's experiences with these games. And of course, check the description where you can find a link to my Patreon page to support my work. And there's also a link to the Cash App if you're not ready for that kind of commitment. And that's it, stay tuned for more.